Um, my family and I, we've been in Cambodia now for uh, eight years doing ministry, in large part uh, because of you. Thank you so much for your partnership in the gospel. Your prayers, your love, and your support uh, enable us to live there, to do ministry there, to partner with uh, the local churches there. So thank you. Um, just a couple of prayer requests. One uh, is a prayer for the local churches in Cambodia. They're at a stage now where they are looking to raise up uh, ruling elders to help guide and shepherd the church. So we humbly ask for prayer that God would raise up men uh, who are qualified, who can love the people of the church and shepherd them. Hello, um, I'm Susan Lee, and I was asked to share some of our personal prayer requests. And as you can see, I have a teenager and a tween. So for parents, I think you understand that I need, we need lots of prayer. Um, it's all new territory for us. And I homeschool, and Caleb's trying to finish up his ninth grade right now. So um, also thinking about college and what that looks like with, while we're in Cambodia, but we hope that he can study in America. So that's all new to us. So we need a lot of wisdom, guidance, love, and a lot of patience. Um, I also ask that you pray for our marriage, where I think Paul and I, we, we're good, but um, a lot of spiritual attacks, and it's easy to take it for granted and just let things slip by. So just learning how to balance ministry, parenting, but make it make marriage a priority for us. Yeah, that's it. Uh, before we turn our, our attention to the Lord in prayer, I just want to say that it's been a, a pleasure. I've known Paul uh, since uh, back in Jersey in our seminary days, and now that they're missionaries, it's always a blessing to talk to missionaries. Uh, we had time to spend with each other yesterday, and one of the blessings is that you just reminded like how ungodly and sinful that you are when you talk to missionaries and their heart for <laughs> the lost, and so. It's always a good reminder to push uh, people towards Jesus. And so uh, please take time to get to know them and say hi to them. And with that said, let me ask everyone to please bow your heads. Let's turn to the Lord in prayer at this time. Father, we thank you so much, that Lord, that you would allow us to be part of your, your purpose and your plan, uh, the Great Commission, that we could uh, certainly uh, just be part of missions, uh, both as senders, as equippers, as churches that raise and send missionaries out, but we thank you so much for Paul and Susan and Caleb and Nate, uh, that they've been faithfully serving in Southeast Asia and Cambodia for so many years, and we pray that you continually use them for the sake of the gospel, that people will come to faith and be discipled in the local church. We pray, Lord, that you would give them a spirit of hope and comfort and peace in the midst of all the brokenness and discouragement that missions would bring for them. We pray, Lord, that as Susan has shared, that you would Continue even in the household to protect them from the temptations of Satan, but also to continue to allow them to grow in their sin, strengthen their marriage, may Christ be the center of their marriage and grace and truth, uh, love and, and mercy. We pray that Jesus would also be the center of their, their household as they continue to raise and balance life and ministry, uh, especially with Caleb and Nate, that they would continue to grow up and to embrace the gospel and to grow in uh, faith and to become godly men, and to follow after the Lord's very own heart, Lord Jesus. And so we just pray for this family that they continually be united in the gospel of Jesus and for the local churches um, in Cambodia, Phnom Penh, and Southeast Asia, that they would be vibrant and growing and thriving, have much wisdom as they raise leaders and elders to become a fully mature churches for the sake of the Great Commission. Uh, so Lord, we thank you so much for this time, and we pray that your hand and your blessing uh, would be over them. We ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. If you have your Bibles, please open up with me to Mark chapter 1. Our scripture reading actually is uh, only several verses here today, Mark chapter 1, verses 9 to 11. And if you are visiting with us, we have begun actually a series last week on, on doctrine called What to Believe. And uh, what we're doing here in the next five weeks is that we're taking a core doctrine of the Bible and trying to understand what this doctrine says about who God is, but also what this doctrine says about our life and about the ministry of this church. And it expresses the doctrine that our church here at New Life Press believes in and tries to apply and to really teach here. And so if you are able, I want to ask you to please stand for the reading of God's word. Mark chapter 1, verses 9 to 11. And please give your undivided attention to the reading of God's holy, inerrant, and his infallible word. 
This is the beginning of Mark's gospel. It says, In those days Jesus came from Nazareth, Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. And when, he meet, and when he came up out of the water, immediately he saw the heavens being torn open and the Spirit descending on him like a dove. And a voice came from heaven, You are my beloved Son, with you I am well pleased. And this is God's word. Please be seated at this time. So friends, as I've said, we're continuing along in our series called What to Believe, where for five weeks we'll consider a core doctrine of the Christian faith. And here at New Life Press, we believe that doctrine and theology is essential. We think it's foundational. Doctrine is life. It gives us a sense of who God is. We believe here that doctrine and theology is so important, in fact, that both for the church but also your individual lives, we won't be able to understand how to think or feel, how to prioritize, how to understand and interpret life in general without doing this from a standpoint of biblical, faithful, reformed doctrine. And so week by week, we'll take a different doctrine to consider how this can impact our ministry and church, but also our individual lives. And so last week, we began with the doctrine of the Word to understand exactly what is Revelation, what is the Bible, why is this so important, what did Paul mean in 2 Timothy 3.16. And today, we're going to continue along, and we're going to consider the doctrine of God. But that's such a deep and long and profound, rich doctrine. So with one sermon, all we can touch upon is a surface level beginning stages of that doctrine. So we're going to look at what's most important in some sense of the doctrine of God, and that's going to be the doctrine of Trinity. And this is the doctrine that makes Christianity distinct from all other religions. It's a doctrine that helps us to understand the world we live in, how to understand marriages and children and family and culture, how to engage in evangelism, The doctrine is so foundational that they say any sort of sin or malpractice in the Christian faith or any heretical doctrine, whatever that may be, can in some form or fashion always be traced back to a faulty understanding of the doctrine of the Trinity. And so that's what we're going to consider here today. We can't overstate the importance of this doctrine. It's foundational to Christianity, and it's the one unique doctrine that flows into every other doctrine in Christian practice, from worship to evangelism to family and and community. And so we're just going to touch base on three verses here. But in reality, for the doctrine of the Trinity, we have to look at various passages throughout the Bible. So Mark chapter 1 is just one clear expression of the three persons of the Trinity. But we're going to look at various passages throughout the Bible to get the best understanding of the doctrine of Trinity. And there's three things that I want to consider here with you today about the doctrine of the Trinity. And these are the three things that we'll look at. First, we'll see that the doctrine of the Trinity it will, is expressed and is shown in God's name. That we can see Trinity in God's name. Because God has various names throughout the Bible from Genesis to Revelation. Secondly, we'll consider and define specifically what exactly do we mean by Trinity. So we'll see it in God's name, and then secondly, we'll define it from different passages in the Bible. And then third, I want to show you why it's so important or why it matters. And so three things about the Trinity. We'll first see it in God's name. Secondly, we'll just define it as explicitly and clearly as we can. And then thirdly, I want to show you that it's not just lofty theology, but explain and consider with you here today, why is this so important? Why does it matter? And friends, I'm going to give you this caveat this morning uh, from the get-go. They always say like the beauty of a great preacher or teacher is to take complex philosophical theological truth and be able to explain it in very simple matters. I'm not going to be able to do that for you here today. This will be deep. It is somewhat complicated. I'll try to give it as clearly as I can, but I think the complexity of the Trinity is why God is so beautiful in of himself. And so we're going to have to put on our theological caps and be able to put our thinking caps on, and hopefully the Spirit will move in and through us here today. But let's look at this together first. We'll see the Trinity in in God's name. And you're thinking, what do I mean by that? But let's think about this together in terms of uh, what are are names in general? And we can recognize that names which all of us have are not just identifiers, but they identify you. They shape you. They give you a sense of value. They they inform you. Names, in other words, are not just designations, but what we call revelation. Names are not just identifiers, but they identify you. They tell you something about yourself. They reveal something about you. That's why we have nicknames. Back in college, there's a close friend of mine. All he did was study every time we were hanging out, but he, his studying just showed in his grades. So his name was Ray, but his nickname was Straight A Ray because he got straight A's every semester. That showed in 
reveal something about himself. You know, this past week, our church had the privilege of hosting an EM Pastors Conference. It was a, a nationwide PCA denominational a conference of Asian American pastors to come and connect and to thrive and to invest and to network with one another. We had denominational leaders in the PCA, and one leader who was the coordinator of MA, which is our church planning ministry in this, in this denomination in the, in the country, his name was Paul Hahn. Hahn. And when you think about that last name, you, I automatically thought that he would be Asian. You know, Paul Hahn, I was expecting a Korean dude to kind of come up there, but when he walked up, He's this elderly, wonderful, Caucasian white brother, very jovial and white and, and smiles really big. It was a little bit of a culture shock because I just assumed he would be Asian because of his name. And that's because even though I got it wrong, names convey a sense of identity, culture, and purpose, doesn't it? Names reveal something about the person. In some cultures, actually, the name, your last name, convey everything about you and your family. They identify you, they shape you, they describe the very essence of who you are. That's why you had multiple titles and names back in the New Testament. If you had multiple names, it tells people in the culture, you are a somebody. If you had multiple titles and names, you have importance, you're powerful. It means that you had multiple dimensions to your personality. It also means that names defined who you were as a person. That's why sometimes we say, don't ruin the family name. Live up to your family name. It defines you. Now, even though that was the New Testament, it's also true of our culture here today. We may not have multiple names, but we have multiple titles and designations. That's why you think our business cards and our accomplishments and our degrees define who we are. Names and titles have that significance. Even in some cultures, the names told you about a family lineage and their heritage, their family vocation. That's why some cultures and family lines have the name Baker, or Fisher, or Taylor, or even Miller. Companies will spend millions of dollars to invest in a logo and a company name because it conveys a sense and a purpose. It gives presence to that particular product. So names have that power. And if that's true in our culture, the Bible affirms this, and it tells us God, too, in the most profound and meaningful ways, reveals his character and his purpose, his plan, through his name and we'll see the Trinity in his name. It, we'll see his character and his purpose, who God is. And that's why Adam, as the image of God, back in Genesis 1 to 3, Adam, as the image of God, showed what God would do in his power and his purpose, because what did Adam do in the Garden of Eden? He named all the creatures and all the animals. That privilege was given to Adam. He named the creatures. That's significant in the creation. That's why the third commandment, what does it say? Do not take the Lord's name in vain. Because God's name is his character. Don't, don't use it frivolously. Don't sin by being contradictory and hypocritical to God's name. God's name is important, is deep, and is profound. So much so, friends, that we could say this. The entire Bible from Genesis to Revelation is really just an unveiling and a working towards the name of God. That God reveals himself in Genesis to Revelation. There's different names, but he exposes and reveals more and more as you move along through the Bible to the climax of God revealing his name most clearly in the New Testament. That's how the Bible is designed. It's wonderfully beautiful and intricate. In fact, the name of God changes as God reveals more of himself throughout the Bible and history. In some ways, God's name becomes clearer as you move from Old Testament to New. And with increased clarity in God's name, you get more knowledge of who God is because more knowledge means more clarity in God's name. That's how the Bible works. So much so, in fact, that even to pronounce God's name has a progression too because we didn't really know how to pronounce God's name back in the Old Testament, at least one of them. But then we get a clear pronunciation of God's name in the New Testament. So there's this tracing and this progression of God's name that reveals who he is. So for example, let me go through this with you. In Genesis, the first name we see in creation is God's name in Hebrew, which is Elohim. And all we can say about that is that he was the God of creation, and Elohim identifies himself with the nation Israel. It's the God that identifies him with specific people, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So at least we know that God is the God of creation, he created the world, and he likes Israel as his people. That's the God of creation. Later on, you move through the Bible and you come to probably the most important name in the Old Testament, Yahweh. And Yahweh comes from this verb basically meaning I am, 
But at some point in the Old Testament, because the Jewish people revered God so much, and you didn't want to take God's name in vain, they never pronounced God's name Yahweh. We didn't even really know exactly how to pronounce the name. It's the vowels got added later into the consonants in the Hebrew language. But for now, we just say Yahweh. It's there in the Old Testament 5,000 times. That means it's front and center. It's supposed to be in your face. God wants you to know that he is Yahweh. But what in the world does that mean? The best way to understand Yahweh, I think, is if you go to this famous story in Exodus chapter 3, where Moses is called by God from the burning bush, and God tells Moses, through the burning bush, you're going to be the leader of my people. Tell Pharaoh to let my people go. Moses goes back to God and says, in a very timid, insecure way, they're going to ask me who sent me, God. Who should I tell them has sent me? And God tells them through this voice in the burning bush, tell them that Yahweh has sent you. Literally in that verse, verse 14, it says, tell them that I am has sent you. Yahweh literally means I am. And this is what God loves to do. He gives you a show and tell. He says, this is who I am in my name. Let me show you what it means. The burning bush is supposed to explain what Yahweh means as I am, meaning that he's independent, self-sufficient, transcendent, otherworldly, the theological term is God's aseity, that he is by himself independent and self-sufficient. Because the burning bush explains this, friends. It's remarkable. When God uses the burning bush, there's a bunch of wood and there's a flame that's dwelling among the bush, isn't there? But when you read the Bible, read Exodus 3, you'll notice that the bush never actually burns up in ashes. The bush never actually is being consumed by the flame. Now, the bush represents God's people. Fire represents God. It means that God to sustain his flame, did it need his people in the bush. God is self-sufficient. But out of his mercy, he condescends, he lowers himself out of his grace and love. God, who didn't need the bush to burn, condescends and he dwells among his people. But he's self-sufficient. He doesn't need us, friends. We are the burning bush. God is a consuming fire, but he sustains himself within himself. That is what the name Yahweh means. 5,000 times. I am self-sufficient. I am all-powerful, otherworldly. I don't need God's people. I don't need my people, but in mercy and condescension, I come and dwell among my people. And then the name I am is taken on by Jesus in the Gospel of John. And what does Jesus say? Second person of the Trinity, he takes on the name of Yahweh to himself. Don't you read the Gospel? What does it say there? I am the door. I am the good shepherd. I am the resurrection and the life. And as he engaged his discussion with the Pharisees, what does Jesus say? Before Abraham was, I am. God reveals himself more in the name. But this builds up, and do you know where the climax of God's name is as he reveals himself in the Trinity? It comes to us in that famous verse in the Great Commission in Matthew 28, verse 19. In Matthew 28, verse 19, Jesus, in resurrection form, he goes and says, Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them, in the name, that's singular, of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Here we have the clearest, most profound, glorious name in the Bible. The Bible is working out from Elohim to Yahweh to I am to showing that Jesus clearly pronounces it. We hear the word. We know how to say it. Baptize them in the name, singular, Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. That's where we see the name of the Trinity. The entire church, friends, the missions of the church, the New Covenant community is marked by this name. That's why when you do baptisms for believers or for adults, but also children, I baptize you in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. That shows that we are marked by this name. His character is given to us. We are a Trinitarian community. We are a Trinitarian people because God reveals that to us in his name. Christ declares God's name really at the climax of Matthew's gospel. That's what it shows us. And the church engages in a Trinitarian manner. So friends, this leads us to our second point. What exactly is a Trinity? We see it in his name. This is what it is. I'm going to read Mark chapter 1 again. At least we see it more clearly. The three persons of the Trinity, and this is what we see. Verse 9, it says, In those days Jesus came from Nazareth of, Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. And when he came up out of the water, immediately he saw the heavens being torn open and the spirit descending on him like a dove. Verse 11, and a voice came out from heaven. You are my beloved son. With you, I am well pleased. And all we see here clearly is actually the three persons of the Trinity. Jesus gets baptized. The spirit descends upon Jesus. Actually, that word there is into Jesus. 
And the father, his voice comes out and says, this is my son. I'm really well pleased with you. I love you. Three persons of the Trinity explicitly there completely. This is the Trinity, friends. We're going to define it here. Jesus was getting baptized. The spirit is upon him. The father's voice comes out. The Old Testament leans more to the oneness of God. The New Testament, we begin to see more, much more clearly the threeness of God. And you're thinking, what does that really mean? Because this is what the Trinity means, that the God who has created us and we worship and loved us is Trinitarian, which means that he is one God who exists in three persons. And you're saying that's illogical. That's irrational, but not as much as you actually think. And also, by the, way, by the way, we don't worship logic and rationale. We worship God as he's revealed in Scripture. That's why we had to start with the Bible last week. We can't believe through logic and rationale. We believe what God has breathed out. But he is one God in three persons. Now, let me try to break this down here. I wanted to avoid these words, but uh, it's not really possible, so we'll see how far we get here. But I'm going to try to explain to you the mysterious equation of the Trinity that 1 plus 1 plus 1 equals 1. And this is what we mean by the end of the day, this rich and deep, mysterious and foundational truth to Christianity. If we understand that God is 1 and 3 and 3 and 1, then we'll have something in terms of our understanding of life and love and people, relationships, beauty, diversity, and yet harmony. But this is what we want to say. God is one God but he exists in three persons. Now, the words that you have to consider here is this. Gregory Nazianus has once said, whenever you think of the God, whenever you think of the three, always think of the one. Whenever you think of the one, always think of the three. But these are the words that we have to understand, how we have to, the church and the theologians, the reformers, they, they spend so much time coming up with these words. And so we can't just throw them out because then we throw out centuries of church history. This is how you want to distinguish this. God is one in essence, essence, three in person. He exists in three persons, but in one essence. And this is what we want to say. God is one in essence and three in persons. We have to understand what essence and person means. It's talking about this in the sense that Father, Son, and Spirit are three distinct persons with their own conscience, yet each person is fully 100% God in his essence. Okay, I know I'm already losing you. There's three persons in one essence. Essence means this. It's basically the stuff that you're made of. You know, the, you know Aquinas and theologians, you know, essence is like being, but really essence means what is the basic stuff that you're made of? And God in his essence is made up of divinity. Godness. That means God is one God in essence, in divinity and godness, but in three persons he exists. But each person, Father, Son, and Spirit, are still fully 100% God in essence. It's not three gods where they divide God up into one-thirds. It's not three gods and it's not divided up, but they're still fully 100% in godness, in divinity, in essence, God himself. But yet, they exist in three persons who are not three gods, but they are each fully God himself. Let me try to explain it this way. All analogies, by the way, are actually heretical, and we'll get to this, but so if you did this in family worship and children's ministry, uh, that's our fault, but every analogy is heretical, and so, but it could be a little bit helpful. R.C. Sproul once explained it this way. He said, you know, citing Dickens' famous line, it was the best of times and it was the worst of times. And obviously that sounds like a contradiction, but only if Dickens actually means that it was the best of times in the same exact way that was, it was the worst of times. But that's not what Dickens means. He means actually, in one sense, it was the best of times. But in another sense, it was the worst of times. God is three in, different, three in one in a different way. He's three in a different way that he is one. God is one and three at the same time, but not in the same way. God is one in essence, but at the same time, he exists in three persons in the same way. Essence is the stuff that you're made of. Person basically means this, friends. Person comes from Greek theater where actors play different roles. It means a person has a distinct conscience to the point where the Father, Son, and Spirit are still 100% God in essence, but they exist in three persons to the point where you're saying, I'm one person, the other two are two different persons. The Father, Son, and Spirit can equally say this. In other words, although this is only limited help, they exist in three different modes. 
So that in one sense, one theologian, Bob Inc. has said, when the hand is open, it exists as an open hand. When it's closed, it exists as a closed hand. There's three modes. So God, in essence, can live and express himself in three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. But they're still made up of the same divinity and stuff. The theologian Norman Geisler has explained it this way. While essence is what you are, person is who you are. God is one what in his essence, but he is three who's in his person. And that's the best I have for you. So now that's really clear, let's move on. But at least we can go through helpful but heretical illustrations. <laughs> Just in case, you know, just be aware. Now, one illustration is that I'm one person, but I'm also a father, son, and a brother, or father, son, and um, a husband. You know, so I'm one person, but three roles. Uh, that's a heresy. Uh, I'll explain why at the end. Another one is, like, the water one's a big popular in water. So there's water, but it exists as, you know, gas, ice as a solid, and liquid, H2O. That's a, that's a heresy. <laughs> The sun may be a little bit better. I think you know, C.S. Lewis came up with that there's a sun, there's a light, and there's a heat. Uh, it still doesn't fully, a little bit better, I think, than the water, but not fully there. Uh, I once heard it explained this way at a youth retreat. The Trinity is like a washing machine because you have the wash, spin, and rinse cycles. <laughs> but actually, that's still a heresy. All of these are a version of heresy called modalism. And modalism basically means there's one person that goes through three modes. So you have a cup of water that's liquid, then it's the same cup of water that becomes solid as ice, and then it dries up as vapor and gas. That's modalism. That doesn't work, actually. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, that's just modalism. I'm one person that goes through different roles. So it's helpful, but it doesn't necessarily work. And that's why the Trinity is mysterious. Whenever you think of the one, you think of the three. Whenever you think of the three, you think of the one. He can be there at the same time, but it's not in the same way. He's one in essence, but he exists in three persons. That three different consciences, three different roles. And that's the Trinity. That's what makes Christianity so distinct and different from all other religions. And this is where we're going to apply this in our third point. Why does this matter? What, how does this help us? Now, Pastor, will help me to explain. There's a list of all kinds of different applications here. But I'm just going to center on a couple. But I want to say this. One way that we can apply this is that it helps us to actually understand uh, authority and equality. A little bit. Authority and equality. That in the Trinity, we see that because they are one in essence, but three persons with three different roles, you know, the Father has a role of sending the Son. The Son has a role of dying on the cross. The Spirit applies redemption from the Father and Son. They have three distinct roles, but yet they're equal one in essence. So this helps actually if you really begin to think about this in terms of major cultural issues here today, about women roles, about racial reconciliation, social justice. I don't have the answers to that, but at least we could begin to think about this from a Trinitarian point, that there's equality, but equality doesn't necessarily equate to the same function or rights, well, same function and performance. There's a differentiation, there's a deference. So for example, there's equality, but different roles and functions. So a parent and child, in some ways, are equal as the image of God, but the parent has authority, so there's a deference. I'm a citizen of the United States, so I'm equal in some sense as the image of God as governors and mayors and the president, but there's a deference there. I'm equal in some sense as policemen, but there's a deference there. There's an authority there as well as firemen. So there's equality, but equality doesn't have to be equated with the same functionality. God is much more diverse than that. He's much richer. Even in marriage, there's different roles between husband and wife, but yet they are equal in dignity, honor, intelligence, and giftedness. But God has a role between husband and wife. In the same way with civil authorities, this helps us to explain that in the world that we live in, we can see Trinitarian echoes throughout society because there's an equality in when we see the society, but yet there is roles and functions that show the diversity of God. In other words, we can see the oneness of God and equality in this world, and yet we have to work out the diversity of God in the three persons, at least in terms of the echo in this culture. Well, how else does the, the, the Trinity help us to understand life and ourselves? Well, it helps us to understand community, friends, the people that you sit with here to the left and right of you. I get this actually from a gentleman, Robert Lethem, and he says this, and I'm just going to quote real quickly. He says, Trinity matters for evangelism and also cultural engagement because he said, I've heard it said that the two main rivals to Christian Trinitarian worldview are on the one hand, Islam, on the second hand, 
postmodernism because Islam emphasizes unity, unity of language, culture, and expression without allowing much variance or diversity. Postmodernism, individualism, on the other hand, emphasizes too much the diversity. You know, if you really push this for you church history folks, there's a difference between East and West church. One emphasizes unity, the other diversity. But postmodernism, there's a diversity of opinions and beliefs and backgrounds, all of which is really good, but they try to embrace this without some sort of meta-unity. Christianity is the only religion, is the only God who actually can make sense in his Trinitarian framework three in one, where there's a oneness that we embrace, but also there's a diversity that we celebrate. Christianity is the only one that has a God that allows us to be able to do this. If God exists in three person, Lethem writes, we who all share the same essence, then it's also possible to hope that God's creation may exhibit stunning variety and individuality while still holding together a genuine oneness. So in other words, friends, when we think about even in this church, how there's a deference and there's differences, the Trinity helps us to embrace differences and celebrate diversity, that different backgrounds, different socioeconomic upbringings, different cultures, different genders, different brokennesses and sin, all of this is possible because of the Trinity, that we could be equal, but yet realize there's diversity that we could celebrate. We can embrace the fact that we are one together, but also realize that we don't have to be mono-ethnic, mono-cultural, mono-thinking primarily. There's a wonderful diversity because God shows that diversity in what C.S. Lewis calls the heavenly Trinitarian dance between Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So we can work that out that our church could show a Trinitarian culture in as much as we hold to one faith and one baptism and one God and Father of all and through all, but yet there's a wonderful diversity of gifts and people and backgrounds and ages that we celebrate because it shows the diversity in the three persons of the Trinity. Christianity is the only religion that's able to do this. And my last application is this, friends, perhaps even the most important one. God being Trinity means that Christianity is the only religion that can truly be a religion of love. The only one. You think those are fighting words. Well, how does that work? Now, John, 1 John 4, 16 says this. Uh, so we have come to know and to believe the love that God has for us. God is love, and whoever abides in love abides in God, and God abides in him. Christianity is the only religion that could generally say God is love. I said this before, but I think it's just a wonderful insight that I've gotten from a commentary. Christianity is the only religion where God intrinsically is love. That's the one characteristic that the Bible shows about God, that he equates God's attribute with himself because love is so basic to who God is. God is love. It's equated. No other characteristic does the Bible explain it that way. Because it doesn't say God is mercy. What does it say? God is merciful doesn't say God is grace, God is gracious. But then it doesn't say God is lovely. He certainly is that, but what does the Bible say? God is love. And the only reason he could be equated essentially in some sense with love is because God is Trinitarian. This can't be true unless God is Trinity in himself. You know, Islam and you know, all these other Unitarian, solitary, monotheistic religions, God could be loving, God can learn love in those other religions, but they cannot be loved because they are monotheistic and solitary. They're Unitarian gods. But our, our God, the Trinitarian God, the true God of the Bible, is love in himself because love requires an object and someone else to love. Even in eternity between Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, there's a wonderful harmony and deferential love and grace and unity in the Trinitarian Godhead where the Father, Son, and Spirit are in this perfect harmony in this dance, as Lewis calls it, that embodies and shows this love. It's innate to who God is. It is who God is within himself, and this religion is the only one that could say God is love because real love requires relationship, a relationship that could only be had as God existed eternally as Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Now, Jared Wilson has said this, in our culture today, so many people search and search for love. We find glimpses and moments, tastes and samples of love, whether romantic, whether from parent and child, whether through friendship. We have genuine experiences of love, and yet nothing quite gets us outside of our own hurts, outside of our own self-interest, our own sins. Nothing quite will meet the deepest recesses of our desire to love, except a God 
who is love in himself. And this is how God showed us his love. In John 3, 16, what does it say? If you grow up in the church, we all know this. But God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. That Jesus, as a second person of the Trinity, he loved us so much that he came down and he took on human flesh. And then he lived a perfect life and then he died the perfect death on the cross and he was raised, resurrected again. And when Jesus, as a second person of the Trinity, who is dancing in eternity with the Father and the Spirit, came down in history, and he loved us so much that he died for our sins and suffered your hell and mine so that we can experience the deepest love that our hearts so desperately crave, but in our idolatry find in the world, but Jesus gives it to us in himself. He opens up this eternal, coexisting, wonderfully perfect love of the Trinitarian God to us. Fred Sanders, the scholar, said this, the Trinity and the gospel have the same shape. This is because the good news of salvation is ultimately that God opens up his Trinitarian life for us. And C.S. Lewis himself, once an atheist, was right when he said, the thing that matters is being drawn into this three-personal life that we get a glimpse, we get reception, we get a taste by the Spirit and the truth of what Jesus has done, where we experience this love, this harmony, this community, this otherworldly, transcendent, godly, Trinitarian love because Jesus came down. And in the Great Commission, he gives us his most clear name and says, this love, when we go think about missions and evangelism of why our church exists, to impact Orange County, to make gospel-centered, reformed disciples who are missions-minded and compassionate, in one way, all we're saying is what Jesus tells us. We have the Trinitarian name of the Father, Son, and Spirit. Go out there and tell the world what this is about. Bring them into this Trinitarian love in the same way that Jesus has brought us into this Trinitarian love so that we can abide in the love according to John 4.16. Let us turn to the Lord in prayer.